He overheard Mulder's introduction and looked up. FBI? Now that's calling in the big guns. Why were you brought out here? We might have a certain background on this case, Scully answered. This death may be related to another investigation we're working on. The detective raised his eyebrows, then gave a weary shrug. Anything you guys can do to help takes work off my shoulders. This is a weird one, all right. Never seen anything like it. No question this one goes in your special file cabinet, Scully said quietly to Mulder. Scully began a perimeter inspection of the crime scene, working around the bustling evidence technicians and detectives. She took out a small knife to pry into a large charred patch on the redwood fence that bounded the Sheck property. The burn doesn't go very deep, she said, flaking away an external film of charcoal, as if the heat was intense but very brief. Mulder placed his hands on his hips and turned slowly around, hoping that an answer would jump right out at him. But nothing did. Okay, Skelly, he said, this time we're not at a nuclear research lab or a missile testing site, just somebody's patio in Maryland. How are you going to explain this one scientifically? Scully sighed. Mulder, right now I'm not even sure how you're going to try and explain it. Not necessarily by the book, he said. First off, I'm going to see if there was any connection between Nancy Sheck and Emil Gregory, or nuclear weapons testing, or even the Manhattan Project. It could be anything. She wasn't old enough to be involved with the Manhattan Project in World War II, but she did work for the Department of Energy, Scully pointed out. We'll see, Mulder said. The coroner had already wrapped up the charred body in a black plastic bag. The radiation seemed to be alarming everyone at the scene. Mulder went cautiously over and motioned for the coroner to unzip the body bag so we could further study what remained of Nancy Sheck. A man in a general's uniform stood just outside the glass patio door speaking with two policemen, who took copious notes in their small notebooks. The general was short, broad-shouldered, with close-cropped black hair and a swarthy complexion. He appeared deeply distraught. The scene instantly captured Mulder's curiosity. "'I wonder who that is,' Mulder said." I heard one of the policemen talking, Scully said. I think he's the one who discovered the body last night. Mulder hurried over, eager to pick up on what the general was saying and to ask a few questions of his own. The concrete was still hot when I got here, the general said, so it couldn't have been long. The back fence was still smoldering, the paint was still bubbling, and the smell... He shook his head. The smell... The general turned to look at Mulder standing beside him, but didn't seem to register his presence. Listen to me. I've seen some combat before, so I've gotten a glimpse of death and how hideous it can be, but not right in our own backyard. Mulder finally managed to read the general's engraved plastic name tag. Excuse me, General Bradukas, did, did you work with Miss Sheck? The general seemed too much in shock to challenge Mulder's right to ask questions here. Yes. Yes, I did. And why were you here last night? The general stiffened, drawing his eyebrows together. We were going to have dinner. Steaks on the grill. His wide face flushed somewhat. Our relationship was not a complete secret, though we were discreet. Mulder nodded, suddenly understanding the general's extra measure of distress. One thing, general... I understand that Ms. Sheck was a fairly important person in the Department of Energy, but when I studied their organizational charts, I couldn't find her program listed on any of them. Had she been transferred recently? Bradukas averted his black eyes. Our, uh, Nancy's work wasn't much talked about. Mulder leaned forward like a hawk swooping in for the kill. Everything depended on the next question. Was Miss Sheck's project connected with something called Bright Anvil? The general reared back like a suddenly startled cobra. I'm not at liberty to discuss that project, especially not here. Mulder gave him an understanding smile. That won't be necessary, General. Bradukas' reaction had been answer enough. The sound Mulder heard in his mind was the clicking of various pieces falling together. Things were still not entirely in place, but at least they were arranged into some semblance of order. He decided his best tactic would be to leave the distraught man alone for now. That's all for me, General. Sorry to have bothered you during this time of great distress. I take it you have an office in the Pentagon. I may come to see you in person if I have further questions. 
Mulder stepped over to the pool. Half of the water had boiled away in the flash of intense heat, leaving the pool warm and murky with brownish scum collecting in the corners. The fireball must have been utterly intense, yet it had not set Nancy Sheck's large home on fire, nor had it spread to the neighbors' yards. Almost as if it had been directed, intentionally focused in a specific area. Mulder's unusually sharp eye glimpsed an object floating near the bottom of the pool, a small glass bottle that drifted about as if it hadn't yet gotten completely waterlogged. He searched until he found a skimmer. Mulder took it to the edge of the pool and dipped the net deep, swirling it around until he succeeded in snagging the dark object, fishing it out. Water trickled off the edges of the skimmer. I found something here, he called. He lifted free a small vial that contained a black substance. Some pool water had leaked into the vial, but just a few drops. The detective and Scully came over to look. Mulder picked up the small vial, tilting it to the light. The object seemed very odd to him, and by its sheer oddness, he decided it must be important to the case. He offered it to Scully, and she took it, shaking it to disturb the contents. I can't say what it is, she said. Some sort of black powder or ash, but how did it get to the bottom of the pool? Could it have something to do with the flash fire? Only one way to find out, Scully, Mulder said. He turned to the homicide detective in charge. We have exceptional analytical facilities at the FBI crime lab. I'd like to take this back with us to run a full analysis. We'll copy you with all the reports, of course. Sure, the detective said. One last thing for my people to do. He shook his head. I've never seen anything like this case, and I think it might be beyond me. Do me a favor and figure this one out. With one hand, the detective brushed his hair back. Sheesh. Give me a stabbing or a drive-by shooting any old day. FBI Headquarters, Washington, D.C., Tuesday, 3.07 p.m. After all her time on the road, Scully was glad to be working in her own lab for a change, even if it was on such a gruesome subject as this. She basked in the solitude and familiar surroundings, she knew where all her equipment was located. She knew who to call for help or a technical consultation. She knew other experts whose skills she respected in case she needed an unbiased person to double-check what she herself had found. In mid-afternoon, Scully entered the main lab of Berlina Lou Kwok. Scully clutched a packaged sample of the black residue Mulder had retrieved from Nancy Sheck's backyard pool. I thought I'd fill out the forms in person. Scully handed over the sample along with the note Mulder had written expressing his suspicions as to the identity of the substance. Lou Kwok scanned the words. Interesting, she said. We can check out Agent Mulder's speculations fairly quickly, but if it doesn't match, we could be weeks identifying the substance. Do what you can, Scully said, and thanks. Meanwhile, I've got an autopsy to perform. Lucky you, Lou Kwok said, scrutinizing the powdery sample. It was a messy and exhausting afternoon. Scully completed the autopsy of Nancy Sheck, but now that she had studied two victims who had apparently died from the same bizarre and lethal weapon, she still had no guess as to what the physical cause could have been. It was easy enough to list the cause of death as sudden and violent exposure to extreme levels of heat and radiation, but that still didn't say where such exposure had come from. Was it a new kind of death beam or a pint-sized nuclear warhead? From her own undergrad classes, Scully knew the physics of a nuclear explosion well enough to understand that a warhead could not fit inside, say, a small package bomb or a hand grenade. Critical mass and initiators and shielding required a certain amount of bulk, and such things left debris, none of which had been found at any of the murder scenes.